everybody. Welcome to episode 489 with my dear friend, Pete Sousa. What's up, Pete? 489? Can you believe it? Wow. Do you remember sitting in my house? It was eight years ago that I started this. I mean, and you've been putting good out into the world, like consistently. And, and, and someone like you, it's very cool to think they can reach beyond through these mediums to help a lot of different people. It's pretty awesome. Isn't it great? 99 countries. I've been listened to in 99 different countries. <laughs> I'm like, really? And I'll, I'll call the kids sometimes and I'll be like, nobody's really listening to me. I'm like, I only had 150 downloads today. And Hadley will be like, mom, 150 people didn't listen to me today. No, no, none at all. <laughs> yeah. And it's so, it's so relative too. like, you know, you will get like, Sometimes where there's like a smidgen of people and then all of a sudden there'll be this windfall. You, you never know. Like we, you and I had said a prayer before we started this thing. I mean, that's how it works. It's, it, it's, it's on God's time and how he sees it. We just got to put it out there. It's amazing because I want to start off with, so people who don't know Pete Sousa, I've known Pete forever and ever and ever. In fact, he went to um, school with my sister and brother at St. Thomas Good Council in Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania. So I've known him forever and ever, and I love him like a brother. You're one of my favorite people. Like, I could just go, like, over the holidays when I would be home and you still lived in Wayne, I would go and hang out with <laughs> you, your husband, JF, and I could just come in there and bullshit with you for hours at a time and your kids are coming through, you you have one of those warm and fuzzy environments that it was really uh, important to be connected to. Well, I love you for that. It's true. So I want to tell you, it's so funny because you're not going to believe it. Somebody called me this weekend. They were at dinner in West Palm Beach and at the table right next to them was your old like major boss, Michael Jordan. Oh. And I was like, oh my gosh. And I thought I would bring this up today because it, you went to high school in Wayne, in Pennsylvania and on the main line. And then you went to the University of Richmond to play football mm -hmm. and you realized you had a heart murmur. So you couldn't play. You graduate and you get a job. Oh yeah. my God. And you I, got a job with who? Well, I started to work, you know, I got a job. In New York City, I started to work for this company called, first job I got was with ABC Radio Sales, just like, hey, let's get a job. My dad was like, you need to get a job <laughs> in college, like, just do something. So I got a job at ABC Radio Sales. It was a disaster because I was drunk all the time or coming off drugs, um, you know, alcoholic. But ultimately, I ended up working in sports, and that was uh, a conduit to working for the Charlotte Bobcats, ultimately the Hornets, when I worked for Michael Jordan. Now, it's not like, you know, I had like a first name basis relationship with him, but I certainly was around him a good amount. And, I, you know, he knew me to give me the head nod that I was the tall guy that worked for him. And the cool thing about, uh, and this was a God thing and a sobriety thing, I worked for uh, the Hornets when I was in addiction, like hardcore. Um, and I was in bad shape and I wasn't my best self. And I remember regretting that at the time that I wasn't my best self. And certainly when I started to get sober, I regretted that, you know, I squandered this opportunity. But as I learned in sobriety, like things have a way of coming back around, um, whether they do actually in reality or whether you wipe the slate clean and you go on living free. With this situation, it came back in reality, and I, I was able to work for the Hornets and Michael Jordan again and be my best self. Um, but yeah, he was a cool dude. Like I, I, again, like I wasn't like running the streets with him, but always real nice, positive, and like was very cool to his employees. Treated us well. But you went from this amazing, and I will never forget the story you've told many, many, many times. I mean, I know many times when you were walking through the tunnel and all of a sudden he touches you and you were like, what? So, yeah, I was, I it was like, I was almost at the end of my rope, like drinking and using. Somehow I had conjured uh, up a way to get this job working like in a small role, but working for the Hornets radio broadcasts. And uh, you know how it goes, man. You're drinking, you're using. This is now 
15, 15 years ago, probably I've been sober for about 13. And, uh, I was out with a woman the night before drinking heavily using drugs. And, you know, I woke up the next morning and we had, it was a playoff game for the Hornets. And so, um, and I was going to be on the air and I had like a role in the radio broadcast and, you know, it was like, my best thinking was to wake up in the morning and to start doing cocaine. And I started to do a lot of it. And then what, what's, what's, what happens with anything? It runs out. And so now I'm at work. I don't have any drugs. I don't have any alcohol or anything to, to settle me down. And I'm like uh, this broken glass. And at a, at a break, I was standing by the court and he was walking by me to go to his seat. And he just put his hand on my shoulder, just kind of like, hey, like, excuse me or what's up. Um, it was very friendly. But I was like, I remember being like, oh, my God, like what? And I remember thinking like, wow, dude, like this is it was a playoff game. I'd always wanted to get into broadcasting. Of course, everybody loves Michael Jordan. And here I was with this golden opportunity and I was just flushing it right down the drain. And at that point, I knew that it had gone so far that I wasn't able like there was no way in addiction that I was going to reel it back in. So it was sort of like one of those things like, wow, I have, you know, I remember that day, I remember thinking, I just want to leave so I can go get some alcohol to settle myself down. Um, and, you know, that's where, that's where I was. And it, it actually got worse, you know? I mean, it got, it, it, it got worse. And uh, I remember feeling hopeless for sure. And that hopelessness then eventually got you saying, all right, I give up white flag yeah. Somebody come help me, yeah. Michael, Kevin, yeah. your mom, your dad, come get me, come help me. And it took you to like working in a fast food restaurant. You went <laughs> from like getting tapped on the back to what can I get you? Fries, double <laughs> fries, Diet Coke. I walked into, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm here in Texas. I went to a Jersey Mike's last night and there was this poor kid who was obviously working his first shift there. And first of all, that sucks because it's like Subway. There's no, you're, you're literally making sandwiches in front of people. They should pay them a million dollars for that. It's like a spectator sport. So this poor kid is trying to do it um, while I'm like right in front of him and he's not doing a great job. And the other guy's giving him instructions. I'm like, bro, we're going to get through this together. I'm like, trust me, dude. I was like, it wasn't so long ago. I was working at KFC. If there was a long line, I would run to the bathroom. They'd be like, yo, dude, like, where are you going? And I had this fight or flight. I was in a recovery house working at a fast food place and I didn't know how to work the register. So my coping skills were to run away. Um, and ultimately I learned how to work the register and sort of learn how to work life a little bit and understand that like, you just got to go through. The only way is through whether you're going to learn or whatever, but the running away stuff is over with. And where do you think you got your willingness to just say, all right, I'm willing to do whatever you tell me to do? I mean, literally, I had to go to the absolute bottom. Uh, it was like, not like you hear stories in recovery where, well, yeah, you know, like, and, and they're true stories. And these people have their own stories. But it's like, you know, some people uh, get off when they still have a family, when they still have a car or when they still are paying bills, like when they still have food in the refrigerator or money in their bank account, I had none of those things. And I think that I had seen how awful my life had gotten because of alcohol and drugs and my two choices that I had made, right. Uh, that I just, I knew that the only way for me to recover from that was to take suggestions from these people like you or from my brothers who were both sober who, who had something attractive and they weren't drinking. Look, you, I know you can agree with me on this. I said this the other day to somebody. If being sober was not fun, I'd be getting drunk. Exactly. Fact, fact of the matter. Like, I'd be getting drunk, but it's fun. Like, it's a great life. So you stick with it, right? And you keep doing what works. But the willingness I got was literally from the gift of desperation. And I love that. And I think that what, you know, the crazy thing is, is that we think it's the liquid and I'm just going to show this bottle, <laughs> you know, it doesn't have liquor in it. Obviously it's water and lemon yeah, and you yeah. have yours. Cheers. And, um, we think that that liquid is going to make all of our life so much fun, but it wasn't. Yeah. It's a that liquid. was the biggest lie. 
It's the biggest lie. Alcohol and drugs was the biggest lie that I ever told myself. And I was a willing participant, but I really, truly believed that this was a reason that I was able to do certain things that I could not do without it. And it was all a lie that I allowed to drive my life into the ground. And do you agree? Because I didn't think about this till when I got sober, but what a prison it was being an addict. Because oh. your entire life, you're like, do I have enough? Is there going to be enough? Where is it? I want to get more, it, like you were just mentioning. And it's like, I didn't realize it was such a prison. Like, I thought, oh, I have so many choices. I had no choices. <laughs> yeah, the moment I am, um, and I think about this too, I look back on my life now, um, being sober for a little bit and have a pretty clear perspective. Like the moment I started to drink and it started to work like around like 14. Um, and this is true. Uh, it was my motivation for just about every, I didn't realize it, but every move I made was towards the next drink. Cause in high school, like, you know, when I started drinking, it's not like you're getting wasted every night, but then you're, part of that and it's not a big percentage you know whether it was so okay you look around they were your friends the overwhelming popularity was not screwed up like i was like right. on tuesday it was like let's game plan how we can get drunk on friday and that's that was like a centerpiece and 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 for me i grew up you know love and i had a very healthy relationship with sports uh you know and that drove me and it experienced it introduced me to a lot of awesome experiences in my life um, but like right away when I started to drink, it was about alcohol and it was about women, which was really about that was another drug. And it was really about ego, too, you know. And do you think that when we are in it. Like, I remember waking up the next day feeling so much shame and so much remorse. And I felt like I had like this moral problem, right? We were both raised our Catholic and mm -hmm. it's like, we're morally like there's something wrong with us, but I don't believe today that there's anything morally wrong with us. Do you agree? Yeah. There was no, I mean, there was yeah, an <laughs> alcoholic and a drug addict. Now this is the thing. Um, when we get sober, there are things we have to work through. Like the, the, the whole idea that like, Oh, like somebody gets sober. So we just, forgive them and they have this like easy path back into our lives is not true like when you get sober when i got sober there was so much stuff that i had to walk through um shame being part of it and facing people and owning my side and stuff that i didn't even think i had a side in but those consequences don't go anywhere like if you lose a job or you're in trouble with the law or you know you break somebody's heart, not like a, a, a significant other I'm talking about, like your mom, you know, like you have to earn your way back into their lives, you know, and that the process of doing that um, is where you can eliminate that shame because you finally start to do esteemable stuff. Because like you said, there's like there, I, I didn't even realize how much shame I had because the moment I started to feel those feelings, I would find a way to you know get drunk again or take more drugs or i i didn't realize how little i wanted to feel you know it's so true because it's like when you're in it and then i remember like i patented so we're not ashamed you know um, the oh, yeah. first thing i did because i had so much shame i was like oh my gosh I've been, i'm such a bad person everything i did that was wrong but then we go and we start doing this and it doesn't get better right away like you went and you went to a halfway house and then you worked at KFC and then you came back home. Yeah, I, I did. And, and, and all that stuff, you know, it was, it was funny too, because my ego was so um, outsized that I don't know that like, I wasn't ready to get sober. I, I, I couldn't get so, I was so broken that the idea of, getting sober where I lived around people that I grew up with and having so little, because at the time I was in my thirties, like I got friends raising families, they own houses, all, you know, they're, everything's good with them. At least that's what it seemed like for me. And I don't have a pot to piss in or a window to throw it out of. And I'm living with my, like, that was just something that I couldn't wrap my mind around. So going to treatment and then 
even going to a recovery house after that, where I was away from my home, like I, I, I believe I can't tell other people what to do, but for me going away someplace where there were four walls and a lot of support, I didn't need to be home for a while. Like I, I was, you know, it's life or death. And for me going away um, and learning how to live sober and becoming on fire with this program um, from doing the work, then I came back home like a ball of fire. By the time I moved back home to Philadelphia and kind of continued on with sobriety and career and personal, I was probably a year and a half sober. And at that point, I didn't give a shit. I was so enthusiastic about sobriety. And really, I was looking back now and, and talking to people. I was put in positions where I was able to help other people who were going through addiction without even knowing that I was because I was sober and had this thing about me that we get right when we're in the middle of the boat um, that was attractive to people. And so like just by being and being sober, I was able to help people. Oh my gosh. You helped me so many times, you know? <laughs> And I mean, I, it was amazing. We would sit in my front red room of my house and we would talk about, we've got to start a meeting. We helped me start yes. this meeting. And we started this meeting, Morning Hope, and it's still going around on today. It's and neither weekend. of us really go. It's on weekends. And you know, somebody <laughs> told me there's like that seven o'clock meeting. It's called the 707 at, um, I guess it's at St. Thomas Church, right? By where the ACME used to be. The yeah. Like that meeting can be a mob scene. And sometimes like, it's like, all right, it's more of a social event. It can be. But like somebody told me, yeah, that they went to Morning Hope on a Saturday. I was like, you mean that meeting's an option? They were like, yeah. I was like, that's where I want to go. Where there's like 12 people and we're talking AA rather than I don't feel like going to a huge group, you know? Oh my gosh, we would sit there on the couches and just hang out in this really comfy church basement. <laughs> it, was all, it was great. And as recently as, I guess four years ago or five years ago when I was home, I was going to that meeting. It's so crazy. Yeah. It's so crazy. It's like just two people that come together and we're like, let's have an idea. You were like, yeah, let's do it. And you helped me get the energy to do it. Oh, yeah. And I, So you started over and then, so you're at home and you're working and you're like, what am I going to do? Yeah. And you get offered this job in Waco, <laughs> Texas. Well, you know, Start, you hold on now. You, you, you. Oh, I forgot. I forgot when you went to Louisiana. Oh, wait yes. a minute. I got to go back to Louisiana. Apart. So I was, I had gotten my like bearings again and had gotten some opportunities to get into broadcasting. Um, and that was going really well, like sports broadcasting. But, you know, it was all like part time stuff. And really, financially, I, I wasn't solvent. So I was given an opportunity to work in TV news. And I had the bright idea, like, well, I guess I'll. I'll do that. You know, I liked morning news. And so I moved to Monroe, Louisiana. And that really is the program, right? Like, I, like, uh, now looking back, I'm like, holy shit, like, what was I thinking? But like, you're just driven by this thing greater than you. And it's not like I went to Northeast Louisiana and stopped going to meetings and folks. No, like, that's the only way I could get through that situation there. Because people in Louisiana were awesome. And they accepted me. And but I was terrible at my job. I, I'm dyslexic. I can't really read. I'm, I'm learning how to read on a teleprompter in front of all these people on live TV. And, uh, you know, you go to the Chick-fil-A. You know, nowadays, I'm lucky, like, where if I go somewhere and people know me from the work I've done here in Texas and local TV or sports broadcasting across the country, like, they'll come up and say, hey, like, I, nice to see you. I've seen you on ESPN or I've seen you on the local news. Like, great job. Back then, it was like people would notice me, but they wouldn't say anything. They'd be like, oh, my God. They're like, oh, my God, that's the guy on the news that is so bad. And you'd know it. So luckily, at the time, my boss stuck with me. And it was the same thing as the KFC. I believed in myself. It's probably not as bad as I'm describing, but it sure felt that way. And I just kind of learned how to do it and got through the hardship. And then I got a job in Waco, which was like a step up. And then I'm in Waco and I'm working here and I kind of really had the broadcasting thing down a little bit. Go ahead. I got to do a timeout. We got to tell you, but what time of day oh. were you on in Louisiana and then Texas? Okay, three, let's talk so, about that. Yeah. You're waking up at three in the morning um, <laughs> to be on the air at 4.30, 5 o'clock. So 
again, initially I kind of was like, wow, this is great. You know, you, I did have that like on fire gratitude, like, you know, and then I was like, man, this is like, this is pretty early. So, but the better I got at broadcasting, you know, seven years um, on the air every day for a couple hours a day, uh, I got opportunities to work back in sports and call games, which I had always been good at. I, even when I was a kid, I would sit in front of the, in front of the television screen, uh, screen, I would call games out loud. And I always had the gift of gab when I was at Richmond and I couldn't play football there. I called the basketball games and, but you know, there's also broadcasting is an art. Like you have to get on the air and off the air and you have to be able to present the beginning of the game. And you know, I, I wasn't able to do that at a big stage when I'd first gotten sober, I didn't know how to broadcast. Well, I learned. And when opportunities were presented to me, uh, when I was in Waco after being on the air for seven, eight years, nine years, um, I was like, boom, like it, it was a very successful um, operation and it was an opportunity I was able to take advantage of. So, but it, it all started with these, these opportunities that I never foresaw coming and that I certainly at the moment was like, wow, this is kind of weird. You know, but you go with it. You literally, you just go, you go with it. You go where your recovery takes you. Well, it's so interesting. So two things I thought about and I wrote them down. One is saying yes. Oh. You always say yes. You never say no. You say yes. So you said yes to going home and yes to going to treatment. And yes, I will go live in a halfway house. And yes, I'll work at KFC. And yes, I'll move to Monroe, Louisiana and do a morning show at three o'clock in the morning as uncomfortable as it was and how you couldn't read and all these things. And then you said, yes, I'll go to Waco, Texas that again, nobody had really heard of except for that crazy thing that happened with David. What's his name? Waco is the best, Biz. Come on, take it. I'm dying to go to Waco. I love that show, the Magnolia group. But you always said yes. And you know, you mentioned something that made me think of a pink cloud because somebody yeah. just actually mentioned to me, a friend said, I was on this pink cloud and now I feel like it's waning. Why well, don't I have a pink cloud anymore? And I think it does wane at times, don't you think? Okay, Biz, I remember being in a meeting with you, the Tuesday night meeting in St. Mary's, and you would, you know, go off on one of your rants. And I remember you, you, you said something and it really connected with me. I, you know, you were in front of me in the, in, in the room. I can remember your back as you're talking, but you're like, whoever said like life was supposed to be easy. It's not easy. Like that's total bullshit. Like your life at times is going to be hard. And I had a sponsor in Hoboken, New Jersey, who I would call him and bitch a little bit. And he'd be like, sounds like it's your turn. And Truly, if you can learn to, re if you can remember that and understand, like, sometimes stuff just really sucks and it can be for a long period of time. Um, but if you stick with it and you stay in the middle, you know, and, and keep your support system around you and do what you need to do to stay sober and, and, and keep that recovery going, like, you know, you, you learn how to get through. Um, but it's like, yeah, shit, it, shit gets real hard, you know, and but you keep going. You keep going. I mean, and, and, and your point to saying yes, and it's good to hear that because a lot of times I do like I'll say yes to commitments. And and, I'll, and look, it's, it's almost like the 12 steps in AA, like, you know, you became willing to do something right. Like, I don't want to fucking do it right now. But <laughs> sure, you need me to do that in a week. Like, yeah, no problem. I became willing. And then in a week, I'm like, fuck, I said I would do that. So I actually have to go do it. But by saying yes to that stuff, it puts me in a position to succeed and, and become better. I don't want to do truly. I, I if it were up to me and like the way that I like to think, like I would just stay inside and watch Netflix all day and, and eat food and hang and just not deal. But like those are where I get the rewards from dealing. Uh, that's when I feel that like excitement and that fulfillment that gives me what alcohol and drugs used to. Oh, I totally agree. And, but I do, and I also agree with that saying yes. And you're like, how do I get out of this? Beep, beep, beep. I just want to reverse so fast. Totally. Yeah. That's a problem. I, I, I heard somebody say that's a problem for future Pete. And then all of a sudden, like, <laughs> it's time for future Pete to put on his cape and do that shit because we're present day. Yeah. That, it happens. 
And it's funny. I want, you know, what you brought up, and I want to get a little spiritual now. Um, when you brought up like things happening and you saying yes, and you didn't really make these things happen. And I think his name is Peter Flaherty, the, the Irish guy who announces for NBC for golf. Do you know what yeah. I'm talking about? No, David Faraday. David Faraday. Jeff always tells me, it's David. It's David. Well, we went and even saw him in New Jersey. And uh, oh, really? He's like, let's go. Yeah, he's like, let's go hear him. And he talked David about Faraday. David Faraday, the yeah. Irish guy yeah. on NBC who does all of the golf. And he talks about how he was drunk sitting at a bar and I think his wife had just divorced him and somebody sat down and said, now, wait, you play golf. And he's like, yes, I do. I do play golf. I can't even do the right accent. Yeah. And he's like, yes, I do. And they said, do you want to come and help announce and do golf tournaments? And he was like, okay, sure. Yes. And that was a God thing. Like that was not like you did not go out and say, all right, this is how my life is no. going to be. No, we have ideas though. Like we do, I, and, and 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 you know, you take care of what you can take care of, and you leave the rest up to God and the universe. And and look, whether you want to acknowledge that at the time, that's what's going to happen. So right. you might as well get over it and realize that there's only so much you're in control of. Control that, and the rest is going to happen the way it's supposed to. Uh, and, and that's not my opinion. That's what's happened to me since I got sober. Uh, and, and, and it's not all like unicorns and rainbows. Some stuff really blows. Uh, but I mean, that's again, like what goes back to your point, like life is not easy. Like, uh, I'll tell you if life, you know, it's, it goes back to the, the bear Bryant, uh, quote, the guy who was the legendary coach, of Alabama, like, you know, like anything that's easy really isn't worth a damn. Like, and that, that's pretty true. Like my brain wants me to take shortcuts, but I don't feel any. I don't feel any kind of way about that, but if yeah. I do something hard and I finish and I enjoy it along the way and I don't attach myself to the end result, like I feel very good about that when it's over. Isn't it the best? It, it like, is. There's so many tools in the big book and in the 12 steps. I mean, I remember when I first got sober, I was like, everybody needs to get sober and do the 12 steps because it's like the most magical thing in the whole world. You're banging and big the, books off people's heads, right? Yeah. Right? Same but same. you first walk into, at least I walked into those rooms going, oh my God, it was like the heaviest door in the entire world, like the gym. You know, I don't go to the gym. We all know the busy doesn't go to the gym. <laughs> but I, you know, it was like that first day I went to that St. Mary's meeting and I had to open the door on a Tuesday night and go, hi, I'm Elizabeth. I'm an alcoholic. And I thought that was going to be the scariest thing in the entire world but it opened up everything yes yeah and it's freeing and you and i and other people out there i think it's cool that we have these shows that we do so we can get sobriety out in front of people because some people don't even make it to those meetings right some people die before they even get there and it's because of that fear and, and whatever stigma they want to attach to it that they don't even get through the door like think about how lucky we were to get <sighs> the door People don't make it there. And and so, like, that's why it's funny when you go to a meeting and, you know, regardless of how anybody's feeling going in there or while they're there, like, you you can let go of that. You know, like, some of the most powerful stuff I've ever been told is, like, you know, you never have to feel the way you feel right now again. And it's, it turned out to be true. Oh, my gosh. So true. And when you walk into a meeting going, oh, my gosh, I'm so scared that I'm going in here and I might see somebody I know. Yeah, who cares? and you're like, and you're like, well, wait a minute, that person walked in here too, thinking yeah. that when they and, came in, like yeah. everybody has that feeling when they walk into their first meeting, like no one is like, nobody gets this like for like amazing feeling going, yay, I finally arrived. <laughs> <laughs> nobody rolls in there on a winning streak. Uh, no. Jelly Roll talking about there's, there's, Jelly Roll has a song that somebody Murph, my man, you you know, sent me this, yeah. um, and it talks about. You know, one of the lyrics is like somebody said to Jelly Roll at his first meeting or whatever, like nobody comes in here on a winning streak. Like and you that's your ego too. that your ego will kill you. Like, I don't want people to think of me some kind of way because I'm going to go to a meeting. I remember when I first got sober, I left a message on my voicemail that said I was out of the country on assignment for work. Everybody knew I everybody knew I didn't have a job like anybody that knew me a little bit was like not not worried about me working. They were worried about me staying alive. So, I mean, you know, that's complete bullshit. I, I, but I think those lies will, you know, they keep a lot of people drunk and keep a lot of people in pain. 
Oh my gosh, so many. And it's so funny because you were you brought up your podcast. Yeah. And Pete started a podcast after I did. And I remember somebody saying to me, Oh my God, are you so mad he's doing this? Are you so mad? And I was like, no, I'm kind of flattered in some ways because I mean, I remember when I was becoming a recovery coach, like I'm thinking I'm going to become a recovery coach too. And it's just, and it's so amazing to see you where you are today. And like, cause I remember us just like hanging out on the couch going, all right, that was a long time ago. And it was, and so many things have transpired since then. Like, like, you doing your show, right? And it's like, and it really is like, you know, there's so many logistical things that can keep people from from doing that, right? From from breaking through like you did. And so for someone like me, it's the same thing as watching someone get sober, seeing you break through and go through all the bullshit, all of a sudden that becomes doable, right? And then now we're both out there carrying the message, but it took people like you to start to, because if you think about it, I mean, even, so you started yours eight years ago, right? So I started mine four years ago. So I know from my own experience, four years ago, there weren't as many like so, podcasts about sobriety. Now I feel like they're everywhere. Now, to what you just said, bring it on. Like the more good that can be out in the universe like that, and, and the more that kind of message can be shared, it's awesome. But it continues to pick up and pick up. And it's one of those things where, I look at it and I'm like, wow, that's kind of amazing, you know? Oh my gosh. Do you get frustrated sometimes as, as somebody, let's go a little inside the podcast stuff. Sometimes I feel like there's like a rotating like guest thing. And I'm like, wait, oh, like. Oh, I, I say oh. something now. I say something. I'm like, how many people did you send this to? Yeah. How many people did you say? I'm not, you know, you can't come on my show. <laughs> but you know what? I do all the time because I get to do that because it's my own yeah. show and I do everything myself. I'm a one man dog and pony show. And you know what? And back to, you know what you just said, Joe Rogan. Yeah. So I started like he is, I don't even know how many years he's been around. Maybe he's nine years. Like it's literally, yeah. I'm kind of like right around him. I mean, I was sitting in my, um, your phone's ringing or something. Uh, yeah. There you go. Um, but Joe Rogan was saying, I remember him saying, like, this is going to take off. And the more, the merrier. Yeah. And it's, like, amazing. It's amazing. But, yes, I, back to the guest thing. I mean, there are the same people that are promoting the same book, the same spiel. They want to get as many podcasts as they want to. I do not want to be an infomercial host. I'm definitely not that. I don't make a cut if you're selling your book, okay? So I'm not interested. If you have a comp- compelling story and you want to get honest with me, I'm ready to hear it. But I don't want to just hear, this is my book I just wrote. Do you want to see it? Here it is. Will you buy it? <laughs> I want to hear, like, the nitty gritty. I want to hear the real stuff, yeah. you know? So I'm just, I, I don't want to be another number. You know me. I'm like, I've never been a sheep. Sorry. That is not busy. I am not a sheep. No. And um, I think I'm blessed that I can make, you know, thank you, JF, that I can do whatever I want to do. And it's okay. <laughs> we got to give them the credit. And, and I think that, like, <laughs> you have empowered yourself, like, with the ability to do that. Like, and it's not, it doesn't happen overnight. Like, you slowly trudge that walk, you know? I really do. I mean, so many times I've wanted to give up. I've been like, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm not doing this anymore. Look at my numbers. Pete has way better numbers than I do. He's a guy. He's a sportscaster. I'm like, it's whatever. I'm just kidding. It doesn't matter. I mean, the whole reason I even started doing this, as you know, was to help the other alcoholic that's out there suffering and just let people know well, that they're not alone. Well, the guys too. Like, you're, you're talking to someone about sobriety. You're really helping yourself yeah. too. Like, I really am helping myself. Like, on days when I don't want to do it, I do it. And it's just like, if you have someone that you're working with, like a sponsor or sponsee, like when you meet with them, it's like, oh, okay, this is great. It's amazing. It's like, that's when you hear the magic, when you have two alcoholics together. I mean, people will say to me, they like to still go to Zoom meetings. I haven't been to a Zoom meeting in I don't even know how long. I go in person because there's this magic, yes. which you know I'm talking about. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah. And you you try to feel it through Zoom, and I get it. Like, if you got sober on Zoom, you don't know what the difference is. So it's like, yeah. cool, you keep doing that. That's how you got sober. I totally appreciate it, and I understand if you live somewhere in the middle of nowhere where you can't get to a meeting. But where I live in South Florida, there's, like, a meeting every minute, like, anytime I want to, revolving. Yeah. And getting out there and getting in those rooms and hearing, like, remembering what it was like. Like, when we were just talking about that, because we have born, for, I have a born forgetter. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. And, and I think that you're exactly right. Getting into the rooms, there's magic. I still will get onto Zoom meetings, right? But I got to make sure, and this is truly, I've learned this, like I need the in-person. I just do. When I'm, when I'm driving from Waco to Dallas uh, to see my girlfriend and I have to catch a flight the next morning because I have a game and there's a meeting, that I can get on a Zoom meeting, like, of course, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is the greatest thing in the world. I'm in my car and I'm getting a meeting at the same time. However, if I, that's all, if that's all my recovery is, like for me, that's just not quite um, what I need to get invigorated, right? What I need to carry the message. It, 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 it is certainly, like you said, there's something to it, but yeah, I like, I like to get out there and I like the, the, the contact. It's like this God thing that happens in the rooms. I want to, I'm, and I'm going to go to something that I don't, and I just want to ask you this. Yeah. Has your relationship changed with God since Kevin, your brother passed away and your dad passed away? Oh gosh. That's such a good question. This, uh, well, first of all, here in my studio, I got a picture of my brother right behind me, uh, oh. surfer, therapist, just kind of like a guy. Like the rainbow. Look at the rainbow. Like, know, is that, that so was, magical? And that was that was a picture taken long before he passed away. Um, but I think I've had a stronger faith um, because I talked to my brother and my dad. And, you know, talking to them is kind of like talking to God. And uh, because there's a belief that I truly do feel them and I, they are still with me. Like, there's no doubt about that. Uh, because they've helped me because the power is greater than me. And when I tap into those two, um, I am, you know, before I call a game, if I'm getting super nervous, I'll literally just think of my brother being like, you're a fucking idiot. You know, <laughs> and I'll laugh, I will. Um, and, you know, that is not of me. And there's something about that that is so special. And never leaves. So it's only strength in my relationship with God. And it's not like some situation where I'm like, Oh, like I can't get to heaven to see them there. Uh, they're, they're with me now. Um, and it's not, I think I worry about people that are constantly like, Oh, like I need, I give my girlfriend a hard time about this. She's like, Oh, I can't wait to go on vacation. You know, I'm like, well, this is a vacation. Like, like, and maybe then she's like, hey, asshole, I got the two kids. I'm running around, with, and like, you know, and so I probably, I try to bite my tongue um, because I know who the boss is over there and, and with her and I. But I, I do sometimes want to make sure that I'm not like, oh, like the destination, whether it be heaven or a vacation or when I get this job, or, you know, finally when I get off work today, it's like, what's going on right now? This is all I have. You know, like I got to find a way to be present and to appreciate it right now. And so I can bring my brother and my dad along me during that walk, you know, like ultimately if I will run into them somewhere else in another universe, that's great. But right now, like I have to have them with me now. I can't wait, you know, and just like I can't wait on the peace of mind or fulfillment. It's so true. It is yeah. so true. It, it is. is and it's like being raised Catholic as hard as it was. And we were made to go to church every Sunday. And you went to church during the week at school. I mean. Yeah. Oh. And it's great. Like, look, like, I, I think, like, there was something to be said for. And this is just the way it worked out. There was no blueprint by anybody. But the fact that I had gone to church, I didn't have, like, this major, like, war with religion I, I had a pretty good experience i you know everybody i bumped into in church was cool to me like you know there was some stuff i got in trouble for by nuns and and brothers and priests in, in grade school or high school but i asked for every last morsel of it like i was i was a hellraiser so and and, and i i never ran into uh much trouble as far as like 
you know, from a moral thing or like I, I never was a, at odds with God. And, and, and I think that that is one thing with sobriety that like it's like, you know, you got to get off the debate squad like it's over. You know what I mean? Like the war is over. Wave the white flag. It's done. Like find a higher power and save your life. You know, like stop like people that talk to me about God and, and all that stuff. And that's why they can't get sober. Like they're moving closer to death. And it's it's not like a Catholic God. It's not like this religious God. It's just you're not it, dude. And if that's where you need to start, that's where you start. And before you know it, then you have a relationship like you and I are talking about now, which is like so strong, you know? It's so beautiful. It is so beautiful. Thank you to Terry. To yeah, my mom. Yeah. Your mom, yeah. Terry Sousa, for having you go to church. Yeah. I mean, thank you. Yeah. And I think that when, like for me, at least when I came in and, you know, you saw step two and it's like came to believe in a power greater than yourself. And I'm like, what do you mean? I already <laughs> have power greater than me. I already got that one. Check. Of course. Yeah. Should I ever, but that is no, so much. Yeah, you have no idea. There's so much there's, and that's the thing too, about my journey and your journey, you know, you've been at this for a while. What are you, 16 years? 18. 18 years. So 18 years, like, and there's still so much more out there for you. You know, I'm, you uncover more. You told me before this started that you love JF, your husband, more than you did when you first married him. Like that is finding, like tapping into what's real and what's what what's what's left in the relationship and what's left in your life like there's really always more there's always more work to do i don't like to think of it as like some exhausting process like today i'm not good enough but there is there's it's kind of exciting to think like there's more to discover there's deeper bonds to establish with people um it's a kind of a cool deal it's so amazing it's so amazing but and i that's to- there if i if i don't if i don't stay sober and I don't work a program like, you know, I'm sitting here talking like I'm part of the mental board of health. Like don't get it twisted. You know, like I'll lose my shit tonight. And I, I, I'm trying to think, I, I almost lost it earlier today. Like, you know, it's, it's about staying in the middle, but understanding like, Hey, if you make a mistake or, or, you know, you act out as long as like, you don't get drunk, you know, you don't do anything like egregious. Like you got to give yourself a break. Yeah. Totally. But I think that those are the tools you're talking about. Mm-hmm. Cause I think there's this toolbox you learn when you're getting, at least for me, it was a toolbox. Like, what do I need to do? Like in the morning I have to pray before I get out of bed or I'm just like, forget it. I'm going to be yeah. done. I'm like, what is wrong with me today? Oh, I forgot to do that thing. Right. And it's yeah, like, totally. And being able to make an amends right away, a 10 step, like being able to look at somebody and go, you know what, dude, I'm sorry. I'm sure you do that with your girlfriend all the time. Oh, I do it with her in the moment. <laughs> And, 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 and she's shocked. Sometimes uh, it takes me a minute to get around to it, but I'm usually pretty good. And I think that for the average person, it's surprising to them um, to have somebody own their shit right away. But for me, it's kind of second nature and it's about accountability. I mean, I, I was talking to another uh, alcoholic last night who was going through a fourth and fifth step. And uh, I was just sharing with them like how, how I went through it and what experience I had. And one of the main things that I, really developed going through that process was accountability. You know, like I had all this stuff that I resented people for. I had all these things that it made me feel. And then I had a part in it, which I discovered. I did not know that. And I've always been, and I know you're like this too. um, And maybe it's how we were raised, but I always had this kind of this, this inside me, like quit your bitching, dude. Like, like I, I can't, if there's something that drives me crazy, it's like, it's just a complaint. It doesn't, doesn't do anything for me like that does nothing for your circumstances now like the only thing and that's what's beautiful about sobriety is like action like and trust me i bitch i complain just like the rest of them but when i hear it coming out of my mouth or i even hear it percolating in my brain right in my mind i'm like dude that lose that like you've got to take action and you've got to be positive because the only thing i have control over one of the only things is my attitude and enthusiasm for life you know your mouth yeah and your mouth exactly yeah but but i mean truly like i i i i i I certainly complain i was complaining today but i i i don't complain that much and i i understand that i'm in the bonus round of life and i shouldn't be complaining about anything 
No. And I want to, it was so funny because when you brought up the four step, I was just about to ask you because I hear so many people that are like, I can't do a four step. I went out on my four step and I'm like, that's your own story. Why don't we embrace our own story and we can embrace the shame. It's kind of funny because I, I just, I just, I listen to the halo app all the time. You know that halo app? I've heard of it. Yeah. I People love it. it. Yeah. I love it. I listen to it every morning. I can't get out of bed without it. And they were saying one day, you like and shame, Mark. me and Marky Mark. <laughs> and, um, but they brought up shame and how God already forgave us for shame. Like that's yeah. like, all, that's our humanness. Do you know Dave C? So Dave C, he's a, uh, he's a guy who talks like this. He goes out towards like Ludwig's. That's where he goes to meetings. And he says, he says to me, Fizz, he goes, my sponsor told me once upon a time, he said, Dave, come down off that cross. There's already somebody up there. And like when he said that, it was like, boom, like seriously, what are you doing here? Like yeah. lose the shame. Forget about it. It's already taken care of. You know? Exactly. Right. And it's like, own your story. It's not a big deal. You, it's not a big deal. Right. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, there's, it's very freeing, too. Oh, uh, it's so freeing. It is like dropping that that backpack yeah. of b- bricks that you're carrying on your back and going, oh, And people can get behind you. This is a reach, but I'll give you a quick sports analogy that I came upon this week doing my show here. It's like, you know, you think about the, the quarterback position. It's probably the most important position in football. But, like, right now the Cleveland Browns have a guy playing quarterback for them. Deshaun Watson. Joe Burrows, he's just so well, hard on the eyes. Not, oh, clue. my I'm, God, he's so adorable. I love Joe not the Bengals, the Browns. I'm talking oh, about the Franks. See, I'm um, like, I don't even. All right, so hold on. So their quarterback is Deshaun Watson, and Deshaun Watson has been accused of all kinds of abhorred uh, legal stuff. Now it hasn't been proven, but there's a lot of smoke, right? And wouldn't it? Yeah, he has trouble leading a team because, you know, he 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 hasn't owned his shit. Whatever it is, he's denied all of it. So let's take another look, and this is another guy who's kind of like a lightning rod, but like. Remember Michael Vick with all the dog stuff. Terrible. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Stuff. Yeah. Horrible. However, Horrible. he got with Tony Dungy. He got with other people. He owned it. He paid his debt to society. He went out on a tour talking about, I was wrong. What I did was wrong. He talked to high schools. And it, over time, it became a peer that this guy's genuine about this. And he was able to lead a football team. And he's able now to have great success in the community and, and, and his life after football. And it's like, there is a real magic to somebody who will own their stuff. And people want to be around that. People are attracted to that. But for so long, I like fought it tooth and nail. I didn't want to own my story, you know? Oh, I think it's so important. Well, I want to ask you, I'm bringing you home with this. Okay. What is happening now in your life besides the Pete Susha show? <laughs> what just happened? Because you finally, and I want to, this is a big question. What courage did it take to say I am leaving this job in Waco that I've been at for nine years. Yeah. I yeah. knew what my paycheck looked like. I knew what I was walking into each and every day. I knew yeah. who was going to be sitting next to me at the desk. I knew we were going to kind of probably talk about a little traffic, a little weather, a little politics, whatever's going on in local news. Yeah. And you, I remember talking to you right before your last day. Yeah. And you were like, I'm going to do it, but I'm kind of nervous. Yeah. Yeah. And tell us about that. Look, God has taken me this far, right? So he's not going to drop me on my head. And I knew good and well that when I walked away from this, like there was a lot of stuff that I was having faith in. Um, But I also knew like, look, if it doesn't work out, like I'll be okay. And, you know, so far it's been great. You know, I'm here with with the show that that I do every day, calling games for ESPN. I've actually gotten more opportunities since since I've kind of turned the page, uh, and and am out there. And uh, I got I got zero complaints, and I'm not waking up at three thirty in the morning anymore. Um, but but I also know too, and I need to kind of get away from this a little bit. Like I'm not necessarily waiting for the other shoe to drop, but I do know that hardship awaits in life, right? I've, 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 I've just, even in sobriety, right? I've had a job. I was working in the NBA Development League and I thought that I was on this fast track to be the next great play-by-play guy. And the team that I was working for moved. They moved to Michigan. 
And I was like, wow. And that kind of screwed me up. So I had to recover from that. You know, we talked about my brother dying, my dad dying, like this stuff happens in life and we move through it. But uh, I, 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 I'm very grateful and I try to live in the moment because I don't know what's going to come next, whether it's great success, great, what I would consider failure or tragedy, like, you know, all I have is right now. And honestly, talking to you about that helps me because I don't, I don't normally think like that, you know? Right. But it's but getting back to you're in the middle of the bed, right? Yeah, pretty close. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You just get in the middle of the bed and everything's yeah. okay. You got to ask my girlfriend. Uh, okay. Yeah, I usually. Well, I, 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 I think, can't wait to meet your girlfriend. So wait a minute. The Pete Sousa show's on every day now. Every day on the Rogue Media Network, the Pete Sousa show. Um, it's it's a sports pop culture show. It's on at one p.m. Central Time, uh, and uh, you can get it on YouTube. You can get it on, in podcast form. And then the payoff with Pete, obviously, the podcast on Rogue Media Network about recovery. Um, Calling games for ESPN, hosting a show for the Big Twelve. Um, that if you live in Dallas or, you know, Phoenix, a big 12 market, you can watch it there. You can get on the big 12 YouTube page. That's it. I'm done plugging stuff. Oh my gosh. So we met the, but, but you do the payoff with Pete. That's once a week. That is once a week. Yeah. Um, okay. and this, this, this great conversation is probably playing on the payoff with Pete right now. People that are listening to this. So thank you for listening. Like, and oh subscribe. my gosh. I love, yeah. Like, and subscribe to busy living Soba too. Uh, you know, it's been, um, I'm really excited for you and I'm so glad that you've said yes to so many things. Yeah. I think so many exciting things are going to happen and yes, hard things happen too. It's like you said, but we don't drink no matter what, do we? No, we don't that, use our dad dying, getting fired, you know, no. having to move, having to get up in the middle of the night, having hard days, getting a flat tire, like all these crazy I'll things. I'll something really human that happened just to kind of, when I was in, I had a football game in Wyoming and I went to Colorado with my girlfriend, her daughter was looking at Colorado University, and we were out in okay. Colorado, a, yeah, a suburb, and then we were at this um, outdoor like bar restaurant area, and it was you could pour your own beer, right? And there was something like, oh wow, I can go over there and pour that. Like it was one of those things where I was like, you have those moments where you're like, dude, never, like like. But my, my brain was like, wow, you could do that. And it was one of those things like I was like, oh, wow, I, I still got this shit. You know what I mean? And oh. there is no way in hell I would allow myself to do that. Like, and you bring God in or whatever. Like, you're not, you're never so powerful. Like, sometimes, like, you got to call God and like, hey, I kind of, I need a little help right here. Like, that's looking like whatever for the first time in like five years, but it's on my mind. Um, you know, we're never out of the woods as far as like that disease. It's still there. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Can I tell you something similar? Well, I went to Southampton with a friend and we got to this house that we rented on Airbnb. There was a kegerator yeah. in the kitchen. Yeah. It's like, it's weird. Like there's possibility. <laughs> like if I can have wine or beer in my fridge and like, I guess I'm like used to that. You know what I mean? But like this whole, like, I'm like, what? Really? Like, that's why I tell people too that are doing some recovery. House parties are kind of dangerous. I relapsed once at a house party. I mean, I kind of knew I was going to drink. I'd stop like doing what I needed to do, but like it's just right there. You just reach over, you pour it, and it's it's just just you always got to be cautious, man. Especially now going into the holidays, like call somebody, ask for help. Like you're not you're not an amateur if you're thinking about drinking. You drank and used for how many years? Right. Like, of course, it's still going to be on your mind once in a while. Like if you have a or whatever, like don't beat yourself up. Just don't drink and don't use. And don't use. And it's so funny because my first sponsor just called me the other, my second sponsor, actually, who I had for 10 years. Remember Margie? Oh, she yeah. Just called, yeah. Yeah. She just called me the other day. It was just her birthday. Happy birthday, Margie, if you're going to watch this. And um, and we I remember talking about the holidays and going, all right, what's my plan? Yeah. How am I going to get out? Somebody call me and tell me the dog's like throwing up or something. <laughs> yes. No, it's true. Like, how do I like you? And, and look, you need a plan as if you're new or if you're second guessing yourself, like nobody's too big for a plan. You know what I mean? Like, don't like humble yourself. That's what this is all about. I, I'm talking to myself now. You got to remember that stuff because, you know, we get sober so we can go anywhere. Like if I have singleness of purpose, there's no place I can't go. The biggest party in the world, 
maybe a seedy environment where I got to get a friend out of there, whatever. Um, but if I'm not feeling spiritually fit, just call somebody, say a prayer. Like I haven't graduated. That's for sure. I, it's so funny because you keep saying what I'm thinking. It's like yeah. literally because we never think. I mean, I have 18 years. You have 13. We still continually go to meetings all the time. And we still call our sponsors all the time. I yeah. mean, I can't make a decision sometimes without calling her and going, okay, this is a big one. What do you think? And yeah. she gives me her time, which I'm so grateful I for. I need to call my sponsor more. But that's just putting that out there in the spirit of honesty. I need to, I need to flex that muscle more. Yeah, it's just, it gives us, it's just nice to have somebody that says, but for one, that gives you their time. Like, yeah. think about that. And yeah. you as a sponsor, you do the same thing. When Do you have a sponsee right now? I did, but he went out recently, so I don't have any, but I'm looking. I'm, and, and, and really, <laughs> the more I go to meetings, the more opportunities will come up. Like, if you're going to meetings and you're getting your hand up and you're sharing, this is what Clint Brooks has always told me. Like, you will get sponsees. Like, if you don't have any sponsees, you're not doing that. So it looks like I got to do that more often. Well, I know. JF, for a while, I was giving him shit because I'm like, uh, do you have a sponsee? And yeah. he's like, no. God's going to drop it into my lap when I know he's supposed to. Well, now he has two. So that's okay. good. Well, yeah. That's what happened. Yeah. <laughs> it's so great to see you. I am so excited about all your successes that are going on. It's amazing. I'm just, and I can't wait to meet your girlfriend. Yeah. And thanks for saying yes, as you always do. Uh, thanks for having me, Biz. Thanks for asking. I love it. I love it. We will have to get him for a second. Well, I'm going to let you go because somebody obviously wants to get in touch with you. Well, All thanks right. for being here, everybody. If you want to reach Pete, I'm going to have his info for his show. I'm going to have his email address. I'm going to not. Yeah, I'm going to. Yeah, well, you want. whatever. Okay. Friends. Okay. Email address, all of it. You're going to find it in the description. And thanks for listening. And if you did enjoy my show, subscribe. And if you enjoy Pete on Pete's side, subscribe. And until next time, everybody. Keep getting busy, living sober. Bye, everybody. Take care. Are you a podcaster? Let's talk podcast hosting. Are you tired of your current podcast host? Need real support in a community that gets it? At Rogue Media Network, we offer top-tier podcast hosting services to help you thrive. From hosting and distribution to dedicated support, we've got you covered. Starting as low as $25 a month. Join our community of passionate podcasters today. Contact us at hello at roguemedianetwork.com.